Um, this is actually not a, a paper, but uh, an overview of many papers and also projects uh, in progress. Most of you are economists. We don't have any anthropologist nor historian. A sociologist like me is as close to non-economists, uh, social scientists as possible. So I'm going to give you, I happen to believe in culture, by the way. I think culture is real, is tangible, it affects us all, except it's hard to measure, it's hard to quantify, it's hard to instrument. Um, so let me begin with uh, an overview of what is Chinese or Confucian or East Asian family. I really like the idea of having a conference workshop on East Asian family, be not because family is important in all societies, in US, for example, but also because family is particularly important in China and East Asian societies for its cultural and historical reasons. Um, to me, um, family is important in Chinese or Confucian culture in part because it is part of um, a folk religion. Uh, as you know, Chinese societies, all East Asian societies traditionally are not that religious, but so religion is very hard to define. But family is actually part of that religious uh, tradition. Uh, so you can see ancestors are worshipped, and uh, there are a lot of um, protocols uh, related to practices of family. I'll give you some examples. This uh, is a uh, um, family kind of uh, 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 site to celebrate the family traditions. Uh, this is a tomb of important uh, ancestor. Uh, family members will gather at special occasions to worship ancestors. Uh, this, is, this is the best picture I've taken in years about family. I took that uh, when I was a guest at the Academic Seneca in Taiwan. You don't find those signs in mainland China anymore. But this says if you're not filial to parents, it's useless to pray to God. So parents are as important as God. Uh, this is just an open sign in, in Yangming Sai in, in uh, outside Taipei. You don't see that in mainland China, but you do see that in Taiwan. And this is part of tradition, uh, Chinese tradition. Fa uh, parents are as important as God. Um, uh, this is very different uh, from uh, 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 Judaism and uh, Christianity and also Muslim tradition. Uh, family is quite important. Um, in this tradition, filial piety is considered an important character or merit in ancient time. You could be promoted on the basis of that. Family is, right now, is extremely important, the source of support, money. Uh, for example, for um, enterprises, especially in rural China, um, um, my friend uh, Xiaobo does that. And, and people borrow a lot from family members instead of uh, from a bank. You have uh, internal uh, informal transfers of resources between siblings, for example. In the US, you don't see much transfer between siblings, but we find quite a bit of sibling uh, uh, transfers between siblings. But the question right now is, I think we want to address, is, is there an erosion of the tradition of family in contemporary China? I think that's part of the motivation of this conference is that question. The answer is yes. I'm going to see, show you some numbers to answer that question. But however, is that really unique to China, or this is just part of a global phenomenon, or kind of families are being transformed, or have been transformed, so that we are less familiar, or rely less on family than before? So if that is true, we have something called the second demographic transi uh, transition, the first demographic transition, is core, of course, is a transition from high fertility, high mortality to a low fertility, low mortality regime. But the second demographic transition is a transition away from the family, um, uh, the importance of family, or erosion of family, to emphasize individual freedom. Uh, individuals are more important in, um, after the second demographic transition. So what are the 
Um, so the main institution being affected in the second demographic transition is the family. So we can think of the main kind of indicators of the second demographic transition. You have late age of marriage. Of course, that also means the practice of sex before marriage or non outside marriage. Premarital sex, non-marital cohabitation, widespread uh, divorce, and the children born to unmarried mothers. Those are a kind of standard indicators of second demographic transition. Those have happened in Europe, in the US, and to some extent, many of them have also happened in China, in East Asian societies. And children raised by single divorced parents as a result of, of divorce. Aside from the last two, others have happened in China and in other East Asian societies. I have four parts. The second part, I would like to compare or situate China, in, uh, situate China within East Asia. And we have, I'm going to show you some numbers. Um, those numbers are drawn from a review paper that's forthcoming in any review of sociology, uh, co-authored with Jim Ramo and others. So we compared four societies, China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. This is in response. I knew Jim was going to ask the question. So I'm going to compare the trends both over time and also across societies. Of course, this is GDP per capita. Um, Japan uh, is uh, the richest society, has been rich for a while, but you see rapid growth of economic well-being in China and Korea but also, also Taiwan is second. So you, we are approaching uh, more parity with time. But this is just an economic indicator. We think economic uh, uh, forces drive second demographic transition. Fertility rate, um, Jing Sun already mentioned, China went through uh, the second demographic transition from high fertility, high mortality, to low fertility and low, relatively low mortality. Um, mortality decline uh, uh, occurred first to be followed by a decline in fertility. But uh, Japan completed its first second, second demographic transition uh, after World War II, uh, before 1970. Uh, Taiwan's first, sec first demographic transition also occurred pretty early, right after the Second uh, World, World War. Um, uh, Japan's second dem uh, first, uh, second, uh, first demographic transition was heavily studied by my former colleague, Ron Freeman, and other Michigan uh, researchers. So, but you see a parallel kind of uh, a decline to reach uh, pretty much uh, a parity with Taiwan's fertility in Taiwan and Korea, even lower than that in, in China and, and Japan. So this is a quite rapid change, social change. How about uh, age of first marriage? This is for men, but I can also show you numbers for women and also show you age of first birth. Um, this is a pretty late, very late age of marriage. And I'm going to talk about why a little bit, maybe the reasons behind the change, but Delayed marriage is quite remarkable. It's quite remarkable. This, those numbers are higher than Asian Americans in the US. And Asian Americans also get married later than whites. whites. So this is a pretty very late uh, age of marriage uh, by comparison. Asian Americans uh, get married 28 and 29 in the US. So those numbers are uh, going back to compare to Asians in Asia and Asian Americans in the US, those are fairly uh, late age of marriage in all four societies. Okay, um, so I said we have a research, I have a research program on marriage and family in China. I'm going to uh, go over some of the papers, late age of marriage, low fertility, that's well known relatively high cohabitation rate, I'm going to discuss later in part four. Relatively high divorce rate, um, that's already uh, discussed earlier, and we also uh, plan a paper, a research project on the topic. And women's level, uh, high level of education and high level of labor force participation, that's relatively well known, 
And I'm going to talk about this a little bit when I introduce the main findings of Mu and Xie paper. Um, we also have relatively high rate of nuclear family form. The trend is uh, of moving away from multi-generational family to nuclear family. Uh, finally, we have very little kind of empirical work on auto wedlock uh, childbirth, uh, in part because the numbers are very few. And this is also kind of universal to all East Asian societies. We have seen everything uh, else. We have seen other indicators of second demographic transition in East Asia, but we don't see out of wedlock births in any of the societies, very little. Uh, but other societies, not just China, um, not just China. I think if you ask individuals of their willingness, they are, uh, have very low willingness. It's not just forced abortion. Uh, I think it's just not well accepted. Uh, that's also true in, in, uh, in Japan. Um, so, so if you think about something cultural, this is a still a cultural co commonality to East Asian societies, quite different from, from Europeans and Latin Americans and, and, and Americans, uh, North Americans too. So that, that's a sticky kind of thing that hasn't changed much. Would it change? We don't know. But so far, there's no sign this is going to change. OK, pass three. How, how well I'm doing in time. I guess you can slow me down. I'm going to slow down a little bit. OK, I, I can slow down a little bit. OK, I have a, another 40 minutes or so. Uh, <laughs> 35, 35 minutes? Oh. 50, yeah. Oh, I need to leave time for discussion? Oh, OK. OK, 10 minutes for discussion. OK. OK, um, I want to um, introduce a topic. Um, women's educational attainment has reached parity, for the most part, with few exceptions, uh, has reached parity with men. And in actually, many universities, uh, women uh, outdo men in academic programs. They have better grades. They have high rates of, of uh, enrollment. Uh, they do quite well. And this is remarkable because historically, if you look at trends from 30 years ago, women's level of education was much lower than men's level of education. But they're much higher in one curve, in humanities and science. That, that's true. Science and technology. I'm talking about the level of education. I was just saying men are high school. Oh, yes, I know that. That's the same as the US, too. In US, engineering, uh, 20 to 1 almost, uh, men to women. It's also true. But this is not particularly about China. If this women's level of education has reached parity with men has occurred in many societies. This is about level of education, not field of study. In science and engineering, uh, still um, th men dominate. This is also true. If, if you think about cross-cultural differences, there's probably less um, male domination in China uh, due to cultural revolution and other reasons than in the US. So if you go to US campuses, you know, so Chicago, you are more likely to see uh, Asian women professor in science than you will see whites, for example. Uh, in, in, that's true in most campuses, OK? Um, and, and for whatever, re many, many reasons I'm, I don't want to get into. But in terms of level of education, women's education has caught up with that of men. But on the other hand, there is a strong norm of hypergamy meaning that women marrying up, marrying men of high social status, that norm has still persisted. Think of, that's why uh, this is such an interesting question. Because if you have culture of hypergamy, women of a social, social status marrying men of higher status, and higher status in the past is measured mostly by education, and if Le level of education has reached parity by gender, and how is that hypergamy is going to be maintained? And I'm going to claim it's 
creates a difficulty on the marriage market. It creates uh, a marriage squeeze in, um, to the extent that's often, I'm, I'm going to that, I think often neglected by economists. They often focus on, my colleagues here, on imbalanced sex ratio. Imbalanced sex ratio is only a small part of the marriage problem. There's a lot of women over the supply of single women in major cities. And it's not a shortage of women that creates difficulties of men for men. It is really the imbalance of education attainment that creates difficulties for men to marry. They just couldn't find women of lower status for them to marry. It's not because there's no men, women for them to marry. And that's a much larger structural problem than imbalanced sex ratio. Could, um, let's say husband and wife have equal education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it is true. Uh, women could make less than men, or for example, they could work less hours and take on le uh, um, less demanding jobs. That will also work, yes. But there's another solution to this I'm going to propose. Are we okay? So sometimes I'm really puzzled by why academic attention is, is really focused on, on one aspect imbalanced sex ratio. It seems. American academics are just uh, fascinated by sex uh, uh, ratio, whereas something else is so, so much more important that affects marriage. I think uh, this is a much more important hypogamy. If you look at 10 to 15 years from now, the sex ratio balance will be much more important. I'm, I doubt that. I, 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 think, I think it's a, it's a OK. Let's just, um, OK, I, I doubt that. But let me just say why. Because you don't have to marry, you don't have to marry your uh, partners of the same age. So age is a big part of this. But do okay. You mean, uh, sorry. Do you mean the, the sex ratio thing and this thing are two separate yes, things? Yes, two separate two, things. Right, yes, indeed. Exactly. And there are uh, economic papers by yes. economists analyzing this phenomena. You Hy think hypogamy? No, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. you can call it hy hy hypergamy, but uh, the, the economists call it uh, the identity problem. In right. US, uh, this paper by per, uh, Bertrand and so on, forthcoming in QJE, they analyze uh, women want to avoid marry, marrying men who are uh, lower in earning or whatever in education. So it's it's identity issue, it's a cultural issue, they argue, and they analyze this uh, issue yeah. Or if they refer to that paper, also the women can pull back, right? It's not that they have to choose necessarily a husband with higher earning. They can adjust their earnings uh, to be less than the husband after the marriage. Uh, deliberately, you mean? Th they right. could. I mean, <laughs> it, it's not yeah, like yeah. they have to predict their earnings relative to their husbands given they can control their earnings. So right. in the Bertrand paper, right, you see the women pulling back hours or staying out of the labor force. So it's, it, it's slightly different that, that they can adjust after the marriage, which is yeah. the only point I was trying to make. I, right, they respond both before and after. Yeah, right. Before they want to avoid the men who are worse than themselves, right? So that there is a huge drop in the relative earning ratio at the point of point 0.5. But maybe uh, let you go ahead and finish no, in, in let me, ten. Let me say something. Okay. Okay. The reason sex ratio is more important is because sex ratio affect the lower end of the ma male, whereas the education affect the higher end of female. B both. So that part is going to create lots of social oh, instability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think that is true, but it's not just imbalanced sex ratio. Um, hypergamy affects both sides. It affects highly educated women and lowly educated men. So it's a mismatch. Well, What's in, that? In support of you know, what you're saying, is I th he's right in the sense that I think there's evidence from other East Asian countries like Japan that actually have a perfectly normal yes, sex ratio. ratio at birth. You have the same we problem. have huge numbers of poorly educated males that are not marrying. Yes. If you waved a wand in China yeah. and fixed the sex ratio tomorrow, you, yeah. in 10 you or 20 years, you'll still have a lot of unmarried, poor yes. males. Yes, that's and right. that's not going to go away. Uh, uh, and, and also, the, I, I think demographically, people should not overstate the elevated sex ratio because 
in two censuses in a row, the survival ratio between zero to uh, age 10 was greater than one, especially for females. So that indicates severe under-reporting of uh, girls uh, at young ages. So what do we see as reported uh, should not be taken for uh, granted. Yeah, but if, if you look at sex ratios across all schools in elementary school, including migrant schools, including uh, uh, rural schools, it's still 115 to 100 of bo more boys than girls. So by the time they're 10 and 11, there's okay. still that sex ratio maybe, problem. Maybe I shouldn't I have think, started I this. Maybe I shouldn't have. I just <laughs> want to make fun of my, my colleagues that you are all fascinated by imbalanced sex ratio because, because it's new, it's sexy, <laughs> it's a sexy thing to talk about. But I wanted to say there's something else that's important uh, in China. Uh, women would like to marry men of higher status, and when educational attainment is, is equal, then you need to do something about it. Maybe you take a less demanding job, or you work less hours, or whatever. But economic factors have become important um, uh, uh, over time, as I'm going to show you uh, results uh, as a determinant of marriage. Local housing price has de deterring effects on age of marriage. I'm going to show you. Housing is a big part of that because they, um, it's very expensive to have independent housing or apartments, and the house, uh, increase in the housing has deterred many young women and uh, men from marrying um, a man of less economic uh, resources. Hypergamy pattern persists. What happened in this, what happened is that in the last 10 years or so, we see, we observe a widening gap between husband and wife. So what do you do? This has to do with um, economic, we know what are the predictors of earnings, education, and work experience. You could have the same level of experience, but you have to have, uh, you have the same level of education, but men accumulate more experience, you have demonstrated uh, potential earnings profiles, and, and that's a good signal uh, for, marriage, uh, for uh, women in marriage market. And, and women could be fresh uh, graduates, but men uh, have to wait a little bit longer before they marry. So we do see, uh, this is just one of many charts we present in the paper. However you look at it, in, from the beginning of the Communist uh, 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 People's Republic of China to around, uh, after the uh, economic reform, you see convergence. You, you see love-based marriage. In traditional societies, the age gap is pretty large. In old, old, uh, before People's Republic of China, the age gap is large, was large, used to be large. And that narrowed over time but now you see a divergence between husband age and wife's age. And we've, we interpret that trend as a response to economic pressure. Okay. Um, then in another paper with, with Yu, uh, we, we look at uh, uh, determinants of marriage. China has had a tradition of early and universal ma marriage. That's quite different from European pattern. I'm going to show you a chart to illustrate that. Marriage is considered uh, autumn, uh, right. Everyone has a right to get married, unless unless they're extremely poor or extremely sick or whatever reason you cannot get married. Otherwise, you are entitled to the marriage. But housing reform has made housing more expensive in urban China, and now marriage is becoming a status. Uh, good, a byproduct. You need to have social status, economic status in order to get married. So we think now China, uh, in China, marriage has moved away from automatic right of everyone to become the privilege of the economically uh, uh, prosperous or at least well-to-do. So that's the interpretation. I think if marriage has an economic price uh, that wasn't true before. Let me show you, this is from um, 2005 mini census data. This is the old cohort, the pre-reform cohort. This is the early reform cohort. This is a uh, late reform cohort. This is for men. 
So this is the Kaplan Meier survival rate being single. How do you define it? Um, by birth. I know, I know. Which birth? Um, I don't remember exactly, but those are. Uh, you need to look at the paper. I this is this is a uh, uh, you and I definitely in the pre-reform uh, cohort. Um, so this is this is <laughs> we we let them grow. So those are those are okay. Just think about this. This is a this is a 2005 and 14. So you back out. Um, this is a starts the I think this starts from. Uh, 16 years old to be zero. They're all being single. And then we tr trace their survival uh, rate of being, being, uh, s being, being single. Survival. So you pretty much see what I claimed before. You have universal marriage pattern. Highly educated wait a little bit longer. They have late age of marriage, those who, with education. So education is associated with late marriage, but everybody get, got married by the end of, of, of waiting period. What's new? This is new. The least educated men, after the economic reform, the most recent cohort, 25% of them were not married by the end of the period and probably would never get married. This is new. Never happened before. So least educated men Quarter of them stayed unmarried throughout their lives. And that wasn't true before. This is from census that this is the new. And I claim this is not because of imbalanced sex ratio. Because imbalanced sex ratio uh, was much later than they're not affected by imbalanced sex ratio. This is a really mismatch. You need to have money and economic resources in order to get married. OK, I need to speed up. For women, it's much less so. Uh, let me see what I have. Uh, so we used uh, China General Social Survey. We constructed uh, uh, retrospective uh, data for urban Chinese. Uh, here, the okay. Those are the cohorts Shane, from 66 feet. What about highly educated women? Uh, there is a less clear pattern for for this data. There's no less uh, le less pattern. Yes, that's right. Uh, this is college. Most of the time, we think highly educated, many highly educated the women stay single. We refer to PhDs and with those with graduate education. Was, what's that? What's that? It's worse more towards the sex ratio prediction than the high pregnancy. You think? If you don't see it at the high. Oh, I see. It's not a symmetric. That's that is true. That is true, but still, it only affects the least educated men. So it's still dependent on social status. So it's not a th throughout every, uh, everywhere. It's, it's still hypergamy. I think it's a hypergamy thing. But it may be both. Uh, no, but this is a, in terms of cohort. In terms of cohort, though, um, the late reform period um, is still, not, not, they are not affected by imbalanced sex ratio. They are too, too old. OK. Um, we look at determinants of marriage. And this is a, a event history a logic model. You can see education has become more negative. I'm going to show you interaction. But em employment is important. It wasn't important. You don't have to be employed to be married. But now, if you are employed, you don't get married. So economic determinant has become strong over time. Uh, Employment in state sector, which was a privilege, has lost its importance over time. Uh, I'm going to talk about housing a little bit. So this is uh, from, uh, with Xi Song, also from her master's thesis. Housing reform started in 1988 and pretty much was formulated or publicized or implemented by 1999, changed housing as a dying way or unit benefit to be a commodity purchasable on the market. This has led to a sharp increase in both housing stock and housing prices. So housing for urban China has played a major role for marriage and cohabitation. Economic determinants have become more important. Uh, this, is a, this is where I, I work in Beijing. Um, several of us, this is Haidian district. 
uh, in Beijing. Housing prices were relatively flat for a while, and since uh, 2005, since I began my work in Peking University, uh, as a punishment, it went up. I, I couldn't afford anymore. Uh, actually, the actual prices is much higher than this. So housing prices have grown enormously uh, in the last 10 years or so. Um, if you look at determinants of, of a housing area, education over time, this is from chip data, two, uh, 1988, 95, 2002, years of education as a determinant of housing area has gone up. So it becomes more, has become more market driven rather than a benefit. Benefit is, was distributed equally to everyone. So education was less important. Now it is more important. Um, okay. Regional variation is huge in China. So any study that uh, looks at, uh, that ignores regional variation is, uh, is not a thorough study. You really should take into account of regional variation. This is a simple plot. We looked at age of marriage as a function of housing price. You can also see, uh, again, this is descriptive. You never know what is the causal. But we think that uh, housing price has a determining effect on age of marriage. Uh, people wait uh, if uh, housing price is high for obvious reasons. You need to. So we have a relative difference that shows that ratio is a relative yeah. difference. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Home, okay. Uh, having a home is the most important status okay. good in the marriage market. But what's your interpretation? So it's the same interpretation as I have. You, you could, uh, if it, yeah, in region with high sex ratio, the marriage age gap will increase mm -hmm. because more limited uh, number of women, also the housing price will go up. You, you see the same correlation, but with different explanation. Uh, I'm not sure it's a different explanation. It's the same explanation, except you use a different uh, variable. It's the same in, uh, interpretation because you need a, a house, you need a house to marry, and for men, you need to afford more than if you are a woman. So it's the same story. So, so there, is a, there is a housing price that puts pressure on newlyweds, and there is a, a sex difference uh, expectation. Uh, it, it, we, or the society or women expect men to provide housing. So that's the main explanation. I don't think the explanation is different yeah, that much. The, the, causal, the causal explanation is different. Your yeah, causal explanation is different. Is exactly yeah. the same. Yes. What, you're what? The sex ratio drives oh. both. You're saying the housing price. No, no, no. No, the, 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 I think the, call, the, the mechanism is the same, except that the instrument is different. I, I, I take it as a kind of instrument, but I think the causal mechanism is the same. It is still, uh, how, how is that different? Because it's still uh, age of marriage uh, is part. Um, is also um, here is the age of marriage. What, what does the age of marriage? It stands for economic resources. So my explanation, both variables are determined by riding sex ratio. <laughs> okay, so, so okay. <laughs> if, if your story is right, if there is no imbalanced sex ratio, you don't see this? I still think you will see this. Even there is no, there, if there is, in, uh, there is no imbalance in sex ratio, I still expect to this, see this. Sex imbalance, sex ratio contributes to this. It's a part, I think it's a part of the story, not a separate story. But okay, I'm gonna ask a question. If sex ratio is, was, in, was balanced in China, do we expect to see this or not? We, the pattern will much less. It could be less, but still we will see a positive. I still think we will see a positive. Yeah, Hong Kong would be very high there too. Oh, see? I think, okay, but anyway, um, so I think it's a, it's the same. Um, okay, I'll show you the chart. It's probably easier. Earlier, if you look at the main effect of education, it has a negative effect on uh, hazard to marriage. But if you interact with ho local housing price, you see very different pictures. Uh, how in market of expensive housing market, education speeds up marriage. In less developed areas where housing is inexpensive, then education 
has a delaying effect because you, it's like traditional society. You need time to, if you are educated, then you're picky. And you don't get married. Early marriage is bad for your career. So in less expensive markets, education has a negative effect on time to marriage. Whereas in expensive housing markets, this is important because this is why this mechanism has nothing, little to do with imbalance in saturation. In expensive market like Beijing or Shanghai or Shenzhen, education speeds up rate of marriage. Uh, your story he, he, uh, explains the man's age, rising age, right? But, but the female's age also uh, at marriage also rise. Your yes. story cannot explain the female's rising age at marriage. No, both, because um, yeah, there is a pooling of resources from both partners. There is a pooling. It's the same. It's less sharp than men's, but you also see the same pattern. This is for women. You also see, uh, because there's a pooling of resources to buy apartment. Right, but it's mainly the men's job in, it's in China, right? It's so not, no, you, there is a pooling going on. There is a pooling. So it's not a 50-50, but it could be 70 and, uh, 70 and 30 percent. So women's, this is actually the same in the US. You know the literature, too. So in the US, highly educated uh, education or earnings potential is, uh, is a positive, has a positive effect, but even for women, for a marriage. So it's, this is the opposite okay, from uh, what Becker would predict. If they both go up, then what your story, uh, how can you explain the widening uh, age gap between husband and wife? And men's uh, has gone up faster than women's. The burden on men's. Burden is, is higher, is yes. Higher burden is higher on men's, okay. yes, the exactly. Rise, the men's age yes. That's right. And also the response, uh, education to local market is also sharper for men than for women. So women respond less sharply than men. That's right. Okay, okay, okay. Are we okay? Okay. So I think this is all. So last part is cohabitation. I think cohabitation is part of the overall story. It's, uh, it's expensive, it's modernized, it's also widely accepted form of, of, of union. Um, so we looked at cohabitation with CFPS data. Cohabitation was not studied at all before, before we started to collect data. We started uh, collecting data in 2008, and before that, almost no social survey had collected the data on cohabitation in China. A um, few things have helped um, facilitate the spread practice of cohabitation. Uh, you have environmental changes, you have rise of individualism, and you have also, let me just uh, mention a few, you have university expansion, uh, so they don't live at home or in the same village, they live independently. You have uh, a rise in housing prices, you also have a change, this is a, thanks to Xiao Gang, a legal description. They changed the wording from illegal cohabitation to non-marital cohabitation. Uh, so that even the government uh, acknowledges the legitimacy of cohabitation. Uh, let me go through results quickly. We used uh, 2010, 2012 China family panel studies. Uh, this is kind of important. Let me slow down a little bit. In the U.S., cohabitation is more widely practiced among low SES groups, among blacks, among people, individuals of low education. However, we did not start studying cohabitation until the 80s. We didn't know who practiced who started the cohabitation trend in the society uh, first in the 40s or 50s. So it's kind of interesting because in China, cohabitation is just starting out just in the last 10 years. So we can study cohabitation when it first practiced. And when it's first practiced, we think it's practiced by more privileged groups rather than less privileged groups. So you can see it's more practiced more by college educated, 
it's, of course, it's also practiced by uh, people of most recent cohort. I'm going to, and also it's more practiced by urbanites than rural Chinese. So there is something that could resemble diffusion. If you think about um, cohabitation as a, as a social practice, in China, it got practiced first by highly educated urbanites. And in the future, it may become, in 30 years, 40 years from now, this is really not based on any data, it could be practiced as a form of union or non informal marriage among those who couldn't afford formal marriage. Would it be true that uh, highly educated are more likely to move away from home? Yes, that's also part of the story. The urbanites are more likely to do that, yes. But these are states. I mean, so if you transit through the state, you might have a period of cohabitation and then non cohabitation. That's right. This is ever, ever. This is ever cohabitation. Yes, that's right. This is ever. So a period of experimentation would be entirely consistent with somebody who's cohabiting and then non cohabiting is never, ever experimented. That's, that's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. Um, so if you do multivariate analysis, you can also see years of education has a, has a positive effect on cohabitation. Uh, urban hukou has a positive effect on education. Surprisingly, uh, members of the Communist Party uh, have low rates of cohabitation. So how do I interpret this? I made an analogy. In the US, uh, religious people are less likely to cohabit than non-religious. What's that? They lied in the survey. That's also possible. So it's a, <laughs> It could be, it could be what, what is called social desirability. Um, it could be, but it's, it's similar to the US religiosity. I think this is part of political ideology. But anyway, but this is also, this is, uh, who asked a question, uh, uh, um, Cyrus asked a question, but this is the area, development is highly associated with cohabitation. So the more developed the area, the more likely cohabitation occurs. So it is positive at a geographic level. This is county level. Uh, GDP per capita. You know, my position is not the urbanization, but moving away is avoiding the parent size. That's also, the, you, yeah, that's also part of the story. But so you have acceptance of non marital sex is part of the story. Uh, but also, uh, housing cost is also part of the story. So many, many things are going on. This is uh, relatively descriptive at this point. Um, uh, let me, okay, consequences. Two things also have occurred that, that are consistent with US data. One is that couples who cohabited before marriage are more likely to experience divorce after getting married. And that, that's always been a puzzle. Um, Lee Lillard, I don't know who, few of them know Lee Lillard, but Jim and I remember Lee Lillard uh, spent quite a bit of time with uh, Linda Waite on the puzzle why cohabitation seems to have a positive association with, uh, with divorce. But anyway, uh, so we see that in China as well. We don't, unfortunately. That's why we don't see symmetry. This is a puzzle. Why we don't see that in women, probably they did unreport either divorce or unreported cohabitation. But we, in principle, um, they should be symmetric. They should be the same. Another thing is non surprising. Those who cohabit are likely to have a child before marriage. So we do see incidences of premarital uh, childbirth associated with cohabitation. Let me just do a comparison between, US, between what we know in the US and what we know now preliminarily for China. In the US, your own SS has a negative effect association in China has a positive. Family background has a negative. In China has a positive for women. Uh, and, uh, and those are quite different. So determinants of cohabitation run different directions in China than in the US. What's similar between the two societies is that consequences are similar. Cohabitation is positively, as positively associated with divorce and, and cohabitation is positively associated was premarital childbearing. Okay, I'll stop here for questions. Go ahead. Uh, one of the 
issues with divorce streets is also in recent years as housing prices have risen, local authorities have imposed regulations on housing ownership. So as a result, some couples simply split up just for the sake of being able to purchase property. Some of those divorces may be real divorces eventually, but many of them were fake divorces, so therefore the uh, well, that's actually much more administrative data, but to what extent also it's possible that even when respondents respond to service, for example, they also sometimes they may be reporting what are their legal status rather than the real status and so on. I think it's quite possible. Mm -hmm. uh, however, those type of things happened before economic reform, even during Cultural Revolution, even before that certain divorces are not announced when they, are, they were true in practice. So you have both ways. Some, some divorces are forced divorces, and some marriages are forced marriages for political reasons, for example, during Cultural Revolution, and also for housing reasons. Yes. And sometimes they get divorced so they can buy. Sometimes they don't divorce because they will lose property. And, and it runs both ways. I think, I think more care should be taken in, in, in interpreting divorce data. Yes, I agree. I think what uh, we, s we see in China now is really uh, kind of a wave uh, following what's happening in other East Asian countries in terms of marriage, right? And um, the change has been extremely uh, rapid since 2000. We're looking really at uh, something like a percentage of women not married at late 20s mm -hmm. going up from 5% yes to 20%. Yes. And uh, if you look at South Korea, uh, well, for China, that's late 20s, 25, 29. Mm -hmm. And for South Korea, 20% unmarried, 30, 34. And for Japan, uh, it's 20% unmarried women, 35, 35 to 39. And if you see the time trend, what how China has been moving uh, to this date, about fifth of women not married, and it's very similar to what happened in uh, South Korea and in, uh, uh, in Japan. So this is really a regional uh, trend, and China is just the late comer. And the other thing, as you pointed out, is quite interesting is the persistent absence of uh, non-out-of-wedlock uh, birth. And mm -hmm. that is also quite interesting. I think that actually speaks to what you began with, uh, which is the emphasis on family. Mm -hmm. That actually shows a one aspect of the family people do not want to touch, mm -hmm. right? So anyway, just two uh, random thoughts. But I, I do want to add though, many women would love to have children, yes. but they would not, uh, partly because you also need a certificate in order to be able to uh, actually have, uh, have, a birth, uh, have a birth, practically. But, but that's in China, though. It's not true in other East Asian societies. The desire to marry is high. The, if you have a survey, ask them if they plan to get married, it's very high. It's almost 90, over 90 percent universal. So desire to marry is universal. And also, as you pointed out, the percentage of women who don't get married remains pretty high. So that, that's why I said it's not imbalanced sex ratio, because so many women stay unmarried in their, their, their uh, late 20s and, and early 30s. They, they don't get married. If there's shortage of women, uh, those women could, could get married. 